Welcome to the webinar, Dyslexia 101, Understanding Dyslexia and Its Impact on Reading, Spelling, and Self-Esteem with Dr. Nancy Mather. As far as WPS is concerned, we are sponsoring this webinar. Uh, we have been in uh, business for 75 years, and when we develop a new test, we bring an author's idea to life, answer a researcher's question, meet a clinician's need, and ideally change an, change an individual's life for the better. So, now I would like to tell you a little bit about our speaker, Dr. Nancy Mather, Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona in Tucson and the co-author of several assessments, including the tests of dyslexia and the Wilcock Johnson Four tests of achievement. She has long served as a learning disabilities teacher, a diagnostician and educational consultant, and she conducts workshop, workshops on both assessment and instruction for students with dyslexia. She received her PhD in special education from the University of Arizona with a dissertation focused on the assessment of gifted students and students with learning disabilities. Throughout her career, Dr. Mather has maintained a special focus on assessment and intervention for individuals with dyslexia and learning disabilities. In particular, her research and scholarship have centered on assessment methods and interventions for children with reading problems. Her articles have appeared in both school psychology and special education journals, and she has published numerous books on topics related to learning disabilities and dyslexia, including Essentials of Dyslexia Assessment and Intervention, Learning Disabilities and Challenging Behaviors, and Essentials of Assessment Report Writing. In addition to the Todd Tests of Dyslexia and the Woodcock Johnson, Dr. Mather is co-author of the Time Test of Silent Word Reading Fluency, second edition, Test of Orthographic Competence, second edition, and the Illinois Test of Psycholinguistic Abilities, third edition. I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Nancy Mather as your speaker on your webinar today. Welcome, Dr. Mather. Great, great, great. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's nice to be here. Uh, good afternoon, I think, to most of you. So um, I'm here in Tucson, Arizona, and yesterday we had our first cool day. It was actually, I went out to get the mail and it was 68 degrees, and I thought, this is cold, this is cold. But <laughs> I'm not sure about you, but uh, like during this pandemic, um, I had trouble even remembering what day it was. And I thought um, Time Magazine had a kind of an interesting explanation, but they said uh, Blur's Day the fuzzy merging of time since the pandemic shut down so much of the world, making it difficult to determine what day of the week it is. Uh, so I guess it wasn't just me. And so um, I really prefer to talk to people um, in person, but I have to show you what I did. So, you know, I made myself a little audience here. So I have my little friends here, you know, and actually this is kind of interesting because when I look out my window, you know, I have a real audience. So um, these owls have been coming to my house for like 10 years. And it was kind of funny because they go away for about five months. And so yesterday when I went outside, the owl was back and I thought he came to see the webinar. Um, anyway, I was happy to see him back. A couple of years ago, I was in Tucson airport and I saw this young man you know, and he's reading Harry Potter. And I thought, oh, he looks like Harry Potter. I asked his mother if I could take his picture anyway. But um, it just made me think about this is what we want for all our children, just to be able to lose themselves in a book and read and, you know, close out the world. And children are so excited when they're first learning, you know, about the alphabet um, and reading. So reading really is my superpower. So when you have difficulty learning to read, um, it makes, as we all know, school very difficult. You know, Alicia is in eighth grade. She says, how I hate reading. Some people say flying is for the birds. I say reading's for the birds. On Wednesday, I get out of reading because the class goes to the library. I guess I hate reading because I can't read that well. If I could read better, I guess I would like it better. And so we do know, you know, all people want to learn to read. This is a young man who is in a community college course. Um, and you can see what he wrote up there on his exit slip. And the day was good, he says, you know, I want to learn to read. And so, you know, we have older students too, who still really 
um, you know, haven't learned to read and are attempting, you know, to go to college. Bet said back in 1936, every child would read if it were in his power to do so. Now, it was kind of cute that so many of you are from Texas because um, a couple of years ago, I was in Texas doing a conference and uh, this was the title of the conference, which is, you know, pretty good for a Texas conference, reading is for all y'all. But, um, you know, again, we do want all of our children, you know, to learn to read. So this is Charlie. Uh, this is the late Dr. Samuel Kirk, who's often been called the father of the field of learning disabilities. And many years ago, he went and saw Charlie. Now, Charlie has strengths in mathematics, oral vocabulary and knowledge, weaknesses in word identification, speed of word perception, and spelling. So, you know, when he's trying to write some words, you notice again, he's in third grade, he's got Number 12 there, he's got a backward F, you know, on from and 15, a backward, you know, F on friend. But, you know, then when he's trying to express his ideas, there's such a discrepancy between his thoughts and his handwriting and spelling ability. He says, Desert Base Camp, when we got there, I was told I was part of a team called the Black Ops Special Government Organization. Just gonna play you just a little quick brief of him reading a primer level passage. Four days before I walked in the park, soon the soon she was soon something a pretty something. A pretty party, and two, I see a party when she was called pool. She was coolly, coolly, and Holy <coughs> and for <coughs> and for yeah, pretty. I have a pretty called soup. I will get can can. Candy with it. So you get the idea. Um, here's a smart boy in third grade who um, is at the frustration level on a primer level passage. Um, his math scores are at grade level, uh, his oral language is at grade level. Um, and so, you know, Charlie is a young boy with dyslexia. So, our main purpose today is just to provide a basic overview of dyslexia. I, I know a lot of you probably have, you know, very advanced knowledge. And so um, this may be a little basic for you, but that's just kind of our goal is to provide um, a basic overview. Now you probably don't have Havelina where you live, but um, <laughs> we do here in Arizona. So we're gonna talk about what is dyslexia? What are some definitions? Um, what's happening with dyslexia laws? What's going on in the brain? Just a short little bit about history, a little bit about heredity and uh, comorbidity, and then just a little bit on the linguistic uh, risk factors. And then um, we'll finish up just talking about the impact on self-esteem. So dyslexia is a specific problem in the development of word reading and spelling skills. Uh, it's not a problem with reading comprehension, but if you have trouble reading words, it affects clearly your comprehension. Um, it affects the development of automaticity with sound symbol connections. It has both a uh, brain basis and as we know it runs in families. It's often accompanied by specific weaknesses and cognitive factors that predict that the person is going to have trouble 
uh, learning to read and spell. Um, having dyslexia affects motivation and also self-esteem. So dyslexia is the most common specific learning disability. And so it does uh, fall under IDEA um, as the most common learning disability. Uh, 70 to 80% of the referrals to special education involve concerns about students' you know, reading developments. So we do know no matter which country, no matter which language, dyslexia is everywhere. So dyslexia, um, it does exist in all languages. So one thing that can be a little bit confusing is we do have the word dyslexia. Um, and then, you know, we have these alternate terms um, for dyslexia. And so it can be confusing to parents because um, someone will say, well, he has a learning disability in reading. Um, and, you know, then the parent wonders, well, you know, uh, does that mean that the student has dyslexia? So um, usually the terms specific reading disability and dyslexia are used um, interchangeably. So this adjective specific, what it does is really show us that it's not everything, uh, that there's a limited number of underlying problems um, and often students are doing quite well, you know, in other areas. So not everything is low. It's very specific to reading. So Linda Siegel said, we don't understand why the term dyslexia is often viewed as if it were a four letter word not to be uttered in polite company. So you've probably seen, you know, a poster or something like this, you know, labels are for jars, you know, not people. But um, the truth is, if we don't have labels for things, we don't have a way of talking about a problem. Um, and even if you're in a school and you don't use the word dyslexia, um, you're gonna have a parent say to you, well, does that mean my child has dyslexia? Because that's the term the public hears. Uh, this was Newsweek, you know, several years ago, um, you know, more recently, you know, Time Magazine. And so the public is very uh, familiar with the term uh, dyslexia. Yuta Frist says, in the first half of this century, the story of dyslexia has been one of decline and fall. Second half, it's culminated in a spectacular rise. Being a rather dubious term, dyslexia has blossomed into a glamorous topic. Rightly so, with a prevalence around 5%, the condition is remarkably common. Now, you know, what's interesting is you're going to see prevalence rates that go, you know, anywhere from 5 uh, to 20%, uh, percent, depending who you're reading or what you're reading. Um, this was going around at Easter time, one out of five peeps, you know, have dyslexia. But you know, what we see really most researchers uh, cite a prevalence rate about five to 8%. So um, not as high as one out of five. Now, one out of five children probably struggle with reading, but um, you know, again, not, not that high probably in terms of having uh, dyslexia. So with the simple view of reading, which was just an equation where it says reading comprehension is the product of your ability to read words times your ability to understand uh, when you're listening to somebody, you know, read to you. And so if you can read words and you have good listening comprehension, you know, you should have pretty good reading comprehension. So within this model, we've got four different types of readers. We've got our students with impaired decoding, but typical listening comprehension. So these would be our students with dyslexia. We have students that have impaired listening comprehension, but typical decoding. Uh, these would often be our students with language impairments. We have students that have both, they have impaired decoding and listening comprehension. Um, and then we have typically developing you know, readers. And so our readers with dyslexia, again, have impaired decoding, but often um, typical listening comprehension. So specific language impairment and reading disability are best considered as distinct disorders 
um, but they often coexist. And so we'll see that there's high comorbidity between language impairment, you know, and dyslexia, but uh, they are distinct disorders. So individuals with problems in reading comprehension that are not attributable to poor word recognition have comprehension problems that are general to language comprehension rather than specific to reading. And so in these cases, um, the instructional interventions would be very different for a child who has problems with reading comprehension uh, versus the student who's having you know, problems with uh, decoding. So we'll just take a minute and look at a few, you know, definitions, um, you know, of dyslexia. So, you know, in the United States, International Dyslexia Association definition uh, says it's neurobiological in origin, uh, difficulties result from a deficit in the phonological component of language, um, secondary consequences are problems with reading comprehension, reduced reading experience that impedes growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. So this is interesting from the uh, Council of the Netherlands, but they say dyslexia is present when the automatization of word identification and our word spelling doesn't develop, does so very incompletely or with great difficulty. Uh, now, if you can say automatization quickly on the first reading, you probably don't have dyslexia, but um, you know, this concept of automaticity is really important. Um, high level of speed and um, accuracy. So characterized in practice, severe retardation in reading and spelling, persistent, resist the usual teaching methods, remedial efforts. Very slow, inaccurate, easily disturbed word identification um, and or word spelling. It was as if he were driving in a NASCAR race in first gear while everyone else was cruising along in fifth gear, that should say. Um, so this is how these kids um, feel in a classroom. Um, you know, they're sitting there, they're on page two and they look at the student next to him who's already on page 10. And, you know, they're thinking again, you know, what's wrong with me? Why, why is this so difficult? So, uh, Rose talked about dyslexia as a learning difficulty primarily affects the skills involved accurate and fluent word reading, spelling. Uh, characteristic features of dyslexia are difficulties in phonological awareness, verbal member, memory, and verbal processing speed, which is rapid automatized naming. Uh, dyslexia occurs across the range of intellectual uh, abilities. And so, the British Dyslexia Association adopted Jim Rose's definition uh, and added in a further paragraph saying the BDA acknowledges visual processing difficulties some individuals with dyslexia can experience. Uh, dyslexic readers can show a combination of abilities and difficulties that affect the learning process. Some also have strengths in other areas such as design, problem solving, creative skills, interactive skills, um, and oral skills. And so the one thing we do see with the British Dyslexia Association uh, definition is they've you know, gone beyond phonological awareness uh, in terms of the linguistic risk factors uh, that contribute to reading failure. Uh, they also note again that some individuals with dyslexia do have strengths uh, in other areas. Dr. Shea, which has what she calls her sea of strengths model of dyslexia, where there's a specific problem in reading words, but it's often surrounded by, you know, strengths um, in other areas, good reasoning skills, good vocabulary, uh, good critical thinking. So, it, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, Dr. Shea, which, uh, she said, let me go forward a little bit, but Dr. Shaywood said, the diagnosis of dyslexia is precise and scientifically informed as almost any diagnosis uh, in medicine. Um, and it, you know, it's interesting when we look back, Henshawood, 1917 said, with the possession of knowledge of the symptoms, there's little difficulty in the diagnosis of congenital word blindness when the cases are met with. 
since the general picture of the condition stands out as clear cut and distinct as that of any pathological condition in the whole range of medicine. And so back in the early 1900s, dyslexia was um, referred to as word blindness. So general kind of consensus in terms of the definition is it's a neurobiological difference that affects the development of basic reading skills, spelling, uh, automaticity of sound symbol connections or phoneme graphing connections. It's accompanied by specific weaknesses and linguist linguistic risk factors. It predicts the person's going to have trouble learning to read and spell. It is a lifelong condition, but effective interventions can reduce the impact. Uh, many other abilities are often intact, uh, and we know they can even you know, be advanced. So, um, you know, we've been kind of following, you know, the dyslexia laws in the United States. And um, back in 2015, there were 28 states that had some type of dyslexia law. By 2020, it was up to 46. And by 2022, uh, every state now has some type of dyslexia law. So we really do see um, increased intention to uh, dyslexia. So mo many states do have handbooks about dyslexia. Um, I, I think one of the really good ones is the California um, dyslexia um, guidelines. And so you can download this for free uh, at this website. And it has you know, a lot of very useful uh, information. It was kind of funny in one of my classes, my first assignment was to have them read the California dyslexia guidelines you know, and the Arizona guidelines, and then just write a couple pages about which one they liked better and which one they thought, you know, was better. Well, everybody in the class really preferred California, unfortunately, but uh, one person said Arizona's is so much better, and the reason was it's so much shorter. It's so much shorter. So a little, there is a little bit of truth to that in terms of, you know, um, being, you know, more readily available to perhaps parents and teachers and things, but um, a lot of states have really good handbooks they've developed. Um, these are just three different places where you can keep track um, of dyslex dyslexia legislation in our country. So maybe you've got a student coming to your school from Mississippi and you're kind of curious, you know, what was going on there. Um, I really like the National Center on Improving Literacy, you know, website. Um, and it, you know, really lets you look at the different uh, laws and what states, you know, are requiring. Some states are requiring screening, other states aren't. Um, a few states have just declared a dyslexia awareness month, you know, but. So, um, you know, this was a, a letter um, from the U.S. Office of Special Education back in 2015 where they said in implementing the IDA requirements that they encourage state and local education agency, consider situations it's appropriate to use the terms dyslexia, dyscalculia, or dysgraphia, both in IEPs, um, in evaluation, and in eligibility. And they encourage states to review their policies so they don't prohibit the use of the terms dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. Um, in evaluations, eligibility, and IEP documents. We still, however, see some school districts that, you know, are sort of reluctant um, to use, you know, the word uh, dyslexia. So just kind of a quick little um, overview here of, you know, what is going on um, in the brain. So we've got these three areas um, that contribute, you know, to reading. Broca's area, phonological processing, hearing sounds, the parietotemporal area, phoneme graphing connections. And then at the back of the brain, we have what's called the word form area, uh, where there's rapid retrieval, letters and words, and where we store images of words. And this word form area is the express pathway to reading, one used by skilled readers for instant word recognition. The more skilled the reader, the more this area is um, activated. 
Now, Dr. Shaywitz, um, you know, has written quite a bit about uh, the brain um, and what is, you know, going on in the brain. Uh, but an NIH-funded study finds that dyslexia is not uh, tied to intelligence. Um, and so it just shows the difference there. The brain area is active in typically developed green readers, you know, versus our poor readers. And so she's talked about the neural signature uh, for dyslexia, um, where the front of the brain is overactivated and the back is underactivated. Uh, and that's what she refers to as the neural signature. And, you know, it's kind of interesting um, when you cut the brain like that with our non-impaired readers, it's the left hemisphere being activated. But with our kids with dyslexia, they're overcompensating um, with the right um, part, you know, the front part of the brain, as well as the right visual uh, word form area. And I think it kind of makes sense because Lots of times when you're working with students with dyslexia, it's almost like they're looking um, at words like they're art or like they're a pattern or they're a picture, you know, rather than um, the phoneme graphing, you know, connections. So this is Dr. Shaywitz just briefly talking about the brain. We have known about reading difficulties for a very long time. The frustration has been, how do you see what happens in the brain of an otherwise healthy child or an adult? as he or she reads. Recently, as a result of extraordinary new technology, we're able to actually image the brain as a child or an adult tries to read. And as a result, we've discovered that there are three important areas for reading on the left side of the brain, one in the front and two in the back. What's most exciting, we've been able to identify and locate the area of the brain that's responsible for fluent skilled reading. That's an area called the word form area, and it's in the back of the left side of the brain, just behind the ear where you might get swollen glands if you were a child. And this area, what's so interesting about it, is when we've examined scores and scores of children, what we've been able to learn is that children, as they get to be better readers and read more fluently, this is the area that's activated. And what's very important still this is the very same area that's disruptive in struggling readers. So that means that struggling readers, even as they get older, they can learn to become better readers. But unless they have an effective intervention, they don't become student readers. They can't read quickly and automatically. And that means they won't choose reading for pleasure or for knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so again, we kind of come back to this concept of the, you know, automaticity. So I just want to spend a minute on, you know, history, but, um, you know, you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been. Um, and if we look back, you know, 1896, um, Pringle Morgan talking about uh, a 14 year old boy um, who was word blind. Says he seems to have no power of preserving storing up the visual impression produced by words. Hence the words though seen have no significance for him. His visual memory for words is defective or absent, equivalent to saying he is what Kuzmel has termed word blind. I may add the boy is bright and of average intelligence in conversation. The schoolmaster who has taught him for some years says he'd be the smartest lad in the school if the instruction were entirely oral. Um, and I think we've all you know, met children like this, that, uh, they would be the smartest kids in the school if they didn't have to read. So um, Henshaw Woods monograph, you know, back in um, 1902, and he was um, an eye doctor and a surgeon to the Glasgow Eye Infirmary. Um, and so he concluded that the brain is involved, that they often, children often have average or above intelligence, good memory in other respects, problem with reading is specific, it's localized, uh, and it's not generalized to all areas of academic performance. And so we see really back in 1902, this concept of specificity or specific problem, you know, with reading. He went on to say that children don't learn to read as easily as other children. Uh, the earlier we identify this problem, the better, so we don't waste time. 
Uh, children have to be taught by special methods adapted to help them overcome their difficulties. Um, already talking about kind of multi-sensory sense of touch, help children retain visual impressions. Persistent persevering attempts will often help these children uh, improve their reading. So Monroe in 1937 talked about, you know, effective reading instruction for these students. It's provided individually in small groups, delivered systematically at a regular time each day, supported with a supply of books suitable to a child's reading level, and instructed by specially trained reading teachers. They found that gains in the remedial work were accompanied in many cases by greater interest in reading and favorable changes in behavior. Um, and I know all of us have seen this in our work as we teach children how to read, um, they become more positive, their behavior changes, um, more cooperative, et cetera. So she said, you know, one problem, and this is 1937, is that there's inappropriate reading material, that uh, there aren't high interest books with simple reading vocabulary, that a third grade teacher only has third grade books. Teachers have trouble then adjusting the difficulty level to the achievement level of their students. Um, and so, you know, again, there's place, I mean, that we still have, you know, some, um, difficulties with these same kinds of things. Now, this was my first book on learning disabilities, Dr. Doris Johnson and Helmer Michael Bust, you know, back in 1967. Um, and so anyway, it's kind of funny, you know, I looked at my toothpaste the other day and I thought, this is pretty funny, age to find toothpaste. Don't you think that that's pretty funny? Anyway, but after I brushed, seriously, you know, that's just what happened. <laughs> Anyway, uh, here's our little, um, you know, cell phone for uh, seniors. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, um, you know, in their book, they talked about two types of dyslexia, visual dyslexia um, and auditory dyslexia. So visual dyslexia confuses letter and words with similar appearance, a slow rate of perception, reversals in reading and writing. Uh, trouble retaining visual sequences, both for reading and spelling. So trouble learning spelling patterns like O-U-L-D and uh, remembering, you know, those patterns. So this would have been associated more with word blindness. And then we have uh, more associated with what is called word deafness. But there's trouble hearing the differences among the speech sounds, trouble hearing uh, short vowel sounds, uh, trouble learning how to blend, you know, and segment uh, sounds. So what do we know from history that we know the brain was involved? Uh, there's a specific problem um, in perceptual processes that affects reading and spelling uh, development. That oftentimes the student has intact oral language and reasoning abilities that are often more advanced in their basic reading skills. Uh, early intervention is critical for these students uh, and reading problems can affect an individual of any level um, of intelligence. Now, there's still some debate about this last statement. You'll hear some people saying you've got to have average or above intelligence um, to have dyslexia, but we'll talk about that a little more in our next webinar. But when you consider this is a neurobiological difference, it really can affect um, an individual, of, you know, any level of an, uh, intelligence. So um, both assessments and instruction have to be planned, adapted for each individual, systematic and intensive. Uh, reading disabilities affect the IQ score because the children aren't spending time reading, so they don't develop the background knowledge in the vocabulary uh, that readers do. A one-to-one -one or small group instruction is effective. Teachers need adequate training and supervision, uh, and reading problems affect emotional well-being um, and self-esteem um, in students. So everything's been said before, since nobody listens, we have to keep going back and beginning all over again. You know, we really do know a lot about dyslexia uh, from our history. 
we do have some children who are really, really hard uh, to teach to read. So this was a study that Dr. Joe Torgerson, you know, did several years ago, but um, they took the most at-risk first graders from five elementary schools. Uh, they had Peabody picture vocabulary test scores above a standard score of 70. The kids got instruction 45 minutes every day from October through May, three or five by experienced teachers or well-trained paraprofessionals. Uh, there was a scripted reading program contained instruction practice phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, um, and comprehension, number of methods to achieve fidelity of implementation, three days of initial training, weekly supervisory visits, uh, monthly in services. So at the end of the year, this is you know, what it looked like. Um, these are the kids in October. This is what it looked like by January. Uh, and this is what the distribution you know, looked like you know, by May. Um, and the four lowest performers in first grade practically, you know, made, you know, no progress <laughs> at all. They made just very little progress, even though they were getting targeted explicit reading instruction, you know, every um, daily. Um, so uh, these kids have been called in every study, uh, the treatment resistors, that even though they're getting, you know, a good treatment, they're not making um, progress. You know, it's interesting when you look back at Monroe in 1937, she said remedial work was unsuccessful in about four or 5% of the cases and that this percentage of cases didn't show improved scores. And so this has kind of been a consistent finding in these studies that again, there are some children who still haven't made, you know, adequate progress. So um, there's strong converging evidence that dyslexia has a genetic basis. Uh, there's not a specific gene for reading. Uh, family history is a key indicator. If one parent has dyslexia, the child has a 40 to 60% chance of getting dyslexia. Both parents do. Um, there's a, about a 75% chance that the student will have dyslexia. And so we're always really interested in you know, family history in terms of um, making a diagnosis, you know, of dyslexia. I mean, so I know I like, I have no sense of direction. And, you know, I saw this good thing. I thought, this is, fits me pretty well. Sometimes I wonder what happened to the people who asked me for directions. But I have friends that they say to me, if you say to go that way, I know it's the other way. Um, so anyway, um, so, you know, there's high comorbidity between dyslexia uh, and other disorders. 40% of children with dyslexia will have another learning disorder um, as well. And so this makes, you know, it um, even a little bit more difficult in terms of um, identification, uh, diagnosis, and uh, treatment. So, you know, in terms of comorbidity, um, ADHD, speech language impairments, uh, dysgraphia, uh, dyscalculia. Um, and then we've got confounding factors. And English isn't your first language. Um, with our older students, you know, we often have, you know, behavior um, and, you know, motivation uh, issues, you know, as well. So primary reading and writing areas that are affected with dyslexia are phonics, sight word recognition, reading rate and fluency, um, and spelling. So, you know, Alicia says, I like writing, but I hate spelling. Um, and she does, she likes to write, you know, but uh, she hates spelling. So there's several linguistic risk factors uh, that contribute to uh, dyslexia. And we'll talk more about these when we do our um, webinar on assessment. But so we have phonological awareness, ability to hear and manipulate speech sounds. We have um, rapid automatized naming, ability to name objects, colors, letters, um, and or digits. Um, we have Working memory, ability to listen to, rearrange information, um, such as listening to a string of digits and saying it um, in reverse order. We have orthographic processing, ability to recall letter orientation and the spelling patterns of words. 
And so we see that some of our uh, students with um, dyslexia really have trouble with orthographic processing. And they have trouble forming visual orthographic images. You know, how do I spell because I knew it yesterday? And so really unstable, you know, word images. So, you know, here's Ethan, he's in sixth grade. And, you know, you could just look at his, uh, the first draft here, my favorite game is soccer. I like it because it's easy to kick the ball, pass the ball also. I like it because I like it because I like scoring goals. But you can see again, he's got three different, you know, spellings, you know, the word because there. Uh, here's Torin, who's in eighth grade. Um, and I think he spells people about four different ways on this page. Um, you know, and again, you look at the difference between the spelling um, and the quality of the um, ideas for who they had a celebration, who they thought was a murder. Two days later, another murder occurred. Two days, T-O-W-B-A-Y-S, okay? Uh, and this is a student, you know, in eighth grade. You know, we've got Ben, how much will 24 gumballs cost? Explain how you found your answer. I used a calculator. <laughs> Good use of a calculator, but um, you know, even when he's writing, sometimes, like you'll see, he's got ice spelled there, C I E, um, and then you look at that last sentence there, he's got with spelled W T, you know, H I, um, and so just again, this problem in terms of recalling the sequences um, of letters uh, in words. So, um, you know, uh, also, even just you'll see like errors in, you know, cursive writing. He's supposed to be trying to write cues. And as you can see, you know, he's got the tail, you know, going the wrong way, you know, in all of these. So, um, reading and writing are so hard and frustrating that sometimes these kids act out, you know, or they just uh, give up. Uh, Danny's in third grade, and um, his teacher asked him to write about his favorite animal. You know, he wanted to write about an elephant, but he couldn't think how to spell elephant, and he got really frustrated, and um, he went out, ripped up his paper into pieces, he ripped it up, and when he came back in the classroom, he taped his paper back together, and he wrote at the top, sorry, I ripped it, sorry, I ripped it, but just again, the frustration, you know, of not being able uh, to spell uh, simple words. And so, you know, we see that dyslexia really affects self-esteem um, and emotional development. You know, it's interesting when they talk to adults with dyslexia, they still say that one of their greatest problems is self-esteem. Um, so here's Aiden. Aiden has dyslexia. He's in second grade. Hi, this is Aiden Hart. Um, I I just called this video because I just wanted to tell you that reading and writing is hard for me because I can't put the words down on the paper even though that I know it. And I try as hard as I can to, but something just won't let it. And I it's hard for me to spell words. It's hard for me to also in write reading to to read the words and um read the big words because I can't see the whole entire thing and I gotta go like at ah, it the and it's just pretty hard for me and I and Miss Brawley and all the people that have been working with me has been trying the best they can and Miss Brawley has been a big help. She's tried the best she can by getting me books on her computer that can read to me and giving me stuff that will just show that word and and so as Miss B. I just wanted to tell you um that um reading and writing is hard for me be because every time the words just get me like they beat me and I don't get them and in writing and reading I feel left out because all the other kids are like writing that and writing this and I'm just stuck on one word trying to put it down 
and then we still like on the first page trying to sound a word out. So I feel left out. And I feel like I'm just not normal or like like everybody else and and I thank everybody that's trying to help me. Thank you because I really needed all the help, Miss Bradley, and the people that are trying to help me. So I made this note. Thank you for watching this video. So we'll see a little more of Aiden in a minute here. But you know, failure to learn to read as others do is a major catastrophe in a child's life. Dolch said back in 1939, I was working with this student, Matthew, and I said, Matthew, you know, write what you like about school. And he sat there and I said, okay, well, write what you don't like about school. And he sat there, but he finally picks up his pencil and he writes, school is fun at recess. You know, and I thought, you know, for Matthew, that's the truth. Um, uh, school's not much fun. Um, Keith Stanovich talked about reading affects everything you do. Uh, slow reading acquisition has cognitive, behavioral, motivational consequences. Slow the development of other cognitive skills inhibit performance on many academic tech. In short, as reading develops, other cognitive processes linked to it track the level of reading skill. Knowledge bases that are in a reciprocal relationship with reading are also inhibited from further development. The longer this developmental sequence is allowed to continue, the more generalized the deficits will become, seeping into more and more areas of cognition and behavior. Or to put it more simply and sadly, in the words of a tearful nine-year-old, already failing frustratingly behind his peers in reading progress, reading affects everything you do. You know, and again, we have some high school students that are still having a lot of problems, you know, with reading. I was at a conference several years ago, and after I was done talking, a mother came up to me and handed me this folded piece of paper, and she said, I think you're going to want to read this. She said, it's something my son wrote, uh, and she walked away, and, you know, I opened it a little while later, but, you know, this is what she handed me, you know, um, and I'll just read the, from the bottom there, but, you know, he, he says, you know, I hate English. I hate thinking about it. These journals don't help me. I hate doing them. I'm not going to be a writer as my job. There's no point in it. Spelling and reading are my disabilities. I get no help to get any better in it. School doesn't help me. That's why I hate school. All the kids laugh at me. School just hurts me. But, you know, again, we can see here is, you know, a young man with dyslexia, um, that, you know, didn't get the help he needs, you know, says how everybody laughs at him. She keeps pointing out my misspelled words. All the kids laugh at me. He's so, you know, embarrassed. We firmly believe it does students with LD little good to be included and socialized in general ed classrooms for 12 years. If these students leave high school, reading at the second or third grade level, you know, with serious self-esteem uh, issues. Uh, Philip Schultz's book, My Dyslexia, he says, my ignorance of my dyslexia only intensified my sense of isolation and hopelessness. Ignorance is perhaps the most painful aspect of a learning disability. Um, and that's why it's really important when someone has dyslexia, we help them understand it. We help them understand what they're going to need to do. We help them understand um, their strengths and uh, how to ask for help. And teach him to become an advocate. So um, Nadine Gab talked about dyslexia is typically not identified till a child in the second grade hasn't learned to read as expected. Early intervention is most effective when provided from pre-K to grade one prior to reading failure. And so she calls this the dyslexia paradox that again, um, children often aren't identified until you know second or third grade. You know, so we do know students with dyslexia need understanding teachers. One of the most important things we can do is choose their teachers. Teachers who are sympathetic, they're interested, they're supportive, developmental, uh, inspiring to these kids. Danny is in fifth grade. He's got severe dysgraphia. 
He says, Dear Miss Caseman, thank you for helping me with my writing this year. You listen to my ideas. Have a great summer. Um, and then we see Peter here in sixth grade. Miss O, I'm sorry I called you an old goat today. You really helped me with my writing this year. You know, your friend, uh, Peter. And so again, um, teachers make such a difference in terms of um, adjustments uh, with students with dyslexia. So, um, you know, a definition is relatively worth it, worthless unless it results in um, action. And so we do need to make sure students with dyslexia get uh, the help that they need and well-trained teachers, you know, are critical. So um, here's Aiden now by fourth grade. Everyone wanted to believe that I would catch up. My frustration grew and I cried a lot. I wasn't catching up at all. In fact, I stayed pretty much the same reading level for over two years. It wasn't until the middle of my second grade year that I got I got reading instruction to help dyslexic kids. Well, here I am reading to you today. I can't. I just need special reading and spelling instruction by a person trained to teach dyslexic kids. I don't blame my teachers. They cared about me, believed I was smart, but didn't know how to teach me. Mm -hmm. So he's, you know, doing very well now. But, um, you know, again, it's really important with people with dyslexia that they know their strengths. Uh, Rogers in sixth grade, the one thing I can do best is make things. The one thing I could wish I could do better is read. But again, um, Roger probably is going to make his living by making things, right? Um, Kevin in eighth grade says, Today I worked on my science fair project. It's coming along nicely. I hate the spelling book. The rabbit cage is almost finished. I hate the spelling book a lot more. <laughs> and so again, you can just see the difference in enthusiasm of comparing the science fair project uh, to the spelling uh, book. So just to kind of summarize here in terms of dyslexia 101, uh, dyslexia runs in families. There's high comorbidity with other disorders. Uh, no one cognitive weakness can rule a diagnosis in or out, no linguistic risk factor. Um, early intervention is critical for our students. Effective treatments provide intensive, explicit instruction in phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, and spelling. Uh, reading accuracy is easier to improve than fluency. And we, again, we kind of come back to this concept of automaticity again, uh, getting the fluency and automaticity uh, is more difficult. Um, and dyslexia affects motivation and self-esteem. And so again, we really need uh, to help our kids keep their uh, motivation and self-esteem um, intact. Students must have highly trained reading teachers. And so that is you know, critical as well. So Jack, age eight, wrote this little mnemonic poem here, this little, and he says, dyslexia, he says, difficult, it's hard to read. Yelling, I get frustrated. Spelling's hard to do. Learning is something I want to do. Easy sometimes at school. Extra time it takes for me at school and to do homework. I can do it, I'll get it. Hard sometimes to read and do homework. Um, his mom then wrote, doing lots of research, then more research, yelling, lots of yelling. I couldn't find someone to help him. School, wanted to wait to test him and start an IEP. He's too young. Love this little guy. Endurance, every aspect of this is a marathon, not a sprint. Extraordinary ability to make something out of nothing with a Lego. Intelligent, to dad and I know he is, the school needs to know he is. Adversity versus anxiety. With the right tools, we are turning this around. And Jack's third grade teacher wrote, don't give up, you are resourceful, super hard work for, listens carefully, eager to learn, exceptionally creative, insightful and gifted in many ways, ask for help whenever you need it. 
Um, and what we can see is this is going to be a great year for Jack because he has a teacher there um, who's anxious to work with him and support him and also recognize his strengths. Kelly Sandman Hurley said that the best way to advocate, advocate for a child with dyslexia is to be so well-trained and informed, no one can or wants to argue with you. And so this is uh, one of the students' little New Year's resolution. He says, I promise to read more because I want to read. And so again, all our kids, you know, want uh, to learn to read. Um, reading really, you know, opens doors uh, for students. And so uh, it's, it's so important that the work you do, you know, helping kids with dyslexia uh, learn to read and, you know, advocating for them. So this is the end of just Dyslexia 101 and um, Stephanie's gonna come on for a minute here and then we're going to have a exciting Q and A session. You guys had some great questions and so we'll get to as many of those as we can. Thank you so much, Dr. Mather. This has been such a wonderful presentation and you've gotten us started on the topic of dyslexia. As someone who has a very close family member who's now an adult with dyslexia, I understand the pain that the family goes through and, and also as a practitioner, as a school psychologist, having evaluated children, I also understand the other side of that as well, trying to make sure you're doing the right thing professionally. So this was such a great presentation. Uh, I do want to uh, actually, uh, Dr. Mather, if you wouldn't mind putting the slideshow back up, we're not totally at the end of it yet. I want to... Um, we want to get there as soon as the questions uh, slide comes up. So what I do want to tell you, though, is that if you haven't seen it yet, uh, we do have the tests of dyslexia that will be coming out uh, in 2023. The pre-sale for that will begin in February. We can go to the next slide. There is a mailing list that you can join that's been in the chat, and it will be posted again now. Uh, if you join that mailing list, you will uh, be uh, put on, you can leave it right there. You, you will be put on an email uh, that will give you updates ab about the assessment. And on that page, also when you sign up for the mailing list, there is a video telling you about the, uh, about the tests of dyslexia. Okay, so if you don't get all of your questions answered in the Q&A today, you will also get an opportunity to get some additional information. So we'll be doing two upcoming webinars with Dr. Mather. One is best practices in dyslexia assessment, and the other is challenges in assessing dyslexia. We are talking in the future about doing something about interventions as well, but that is to come in the future. Uh, we do have, you can go to the next slide, we do have uh, assessment consultants who are professionals that are ready to help answer questions that you might have. If you, again, don't get all of your questions answered today, we have these professionals who are available, and you can contact them at consult at wpspublish.com. Also, uh, I am available as well. Uh, I am a business development manager along with Ann Rogers, who is also a business development manager. As business development managers, we bring forward to the WPS team the needs, opinions, and concerns of professional sets so that solutions can be discovered and delivered. I'm focused, I know some people had questions about teachers, special ed teachers, et cetera. I'm focusing on teachers, general ed teachers, counselors, reading specialists, and special ed teachers and resources for those uh, professionals. And Anne will focus, is, focus on the needs of healthcare institutions and practitioners there. This is the regional map for the assessment consultants. And uh, we are offering a dyslexia awareness discount for 10% off WPS assessments for anyone that wants to purchase those. Also, we have posted some resources in the chat, uh, and these are some of our resources that are available. You will get the slideshow after this. You'll be able to get the copy of those uh, links as well. And you can also do fill out our contact us by email form um, if you would like. All right, let's get to this Q&A, Dr. Mather. I'm ready. We can stop the slideshow, and okay. I'm ready to... 
ask you some questions. So I did answer a lot of questions in the Q&A that were posed because we've talked about some questions ahead of time. Why do you think there's been this heightened demand for distinguishing dyslexia from SLD? And, uh, or, um, you know, why do you think it's not included under the IDA? I know you already talked about the Dear Colleague letter. We're going to go ahead and post that link and to the Dear Colleague letter in the chat box again. But I just wanted to get your take on that. Well, I think one thing that's happened is there's just, as we saw with all the laws and things, there's just such de um, increased dyslexia awareness. Um, I think the decoding dyslexia groups spearheaded by parents have done a lot in terms of getting legislation to happen um, and concerns about making sure their children with dyslexia are getting uh, proper services in schools, the right kind of services. But uh, the category still falls under IDEA um, and so it's not a separate area of eligibility, but there has been just, you know, a lot of increased attention to dyslexia, you know, in the last really five years or so. Do you feel that um, the attention, there's attention not only in the, in the schools, but also in private, for private practitioners, but also at the college preparatory programs. I know somebody had brought that up. So they are beginning to change the requirements for people who are in um, colleges that are uh, in teacher training programs, et cetera. Is that, is that what you understand as well? You know, hopefully, I think uh, maybe it's a little bit slow, but, um, you know, and that, that has been part of our problem is adequate teacher training. But I think a lot of colleges are making an effort now to make sure teachers really know how to teach reading to children with dyslexia. Um, and so I think that's happening. You know, um, you know, I remember Dr. Shaywood said, uh, you know, we don't have a knowledge gap, we have an action gap. And we still have a bit of an action gap in terms of educating our teachers um, to know how to teach reading, you know, to children like Aiden, you know? Right. And because there was that whole language approach for a really long time, which kind of um, wasn't addressing uh, the phonics and, and other things that you need to help kids with dyslexia. Okay, let's go to, I know you talked a little bit about DSM-5. Someone wanted to know about the DSM-5 category of learning disorder and why dyslexia is not a specific learning disorder. Well, I mean, under DSM-5, it is uh, a single overall diagnosis, specific learning disorder, um, and it, with an impairment in reading, but that can be, you know, word reading, fluency, or greater fluency, or reading comprehension. And so dyslexia is not, you know, um, a learning impairment uh, in reading comprehension. But, um, you know, I just, I think the more specific we can be, the better off we are. It's a, the term, you know, learning disabilities is so generic. And I think it's just, much more um, targeted if we talk about, you know, dyslexia and dysgraphia, because people know then, you know, um, they know what it means. And so, um, you know, it's interesting. I've sometimes run into college students who say, well, I've got a learning disability. And I'll say, well, what is your learning disability? And they'll say, well, I don't know. They told me I had a learning disability, but they have no understanding of what that even meant, you know, and um, can't explain it. And so, I just think as specific as we can be, the better off we are. And I'm just afraid if someone says, leaves it at specific learning disorder with an impairment in reading, it's like, okay, you know, what part of reading? Um, right. But, you know, some of the comments that I'm seeing also uh, are that who is the, who is the expert to assess for and who, who should be doing this assessment? And my response to that, and I want to see if you agree, is that, you know, when you have to assess for something, you, you talk about everybody who's at the table who can assess for maybe parts of it, or, you know, it, it doesn't have to be territorial, right? You, you should use the skills for whoever's at the table to do the assessment. Yeah. Is that how you see it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's, it just depends in terms of the, you know, type of training people have had. Um, so, you know, that's sort of a school district by school district decision in terms of type of training people have had, you mm -hmm. know, background. Right. Um, okay. What, what, in what ways can dyslexia impact IQ testing? Well, we talked about that a little bit, you know, briefly, but it's like, you know, what happens if you have dyslexia, you don't um, lots of time spend a lot of time reading or 
pleasurable reading. And so uh, it starts affecting, you know, your vocabulary, your wor world knowledge. And so, you know, you just um, kind of declines with time because, you know, past third grade, the main way we learn words is reading, not talking. And so, um, you know, it just starts having, you know, effect. The, the other thing is too, many students with dyslexia have like working memory problems or something. And again, then they do poorly on that aspect of an intelligence test. Um, and so it, you know, makes them look like they're not smart, you know, so. Uh, what are some early warning signs in preschool and kindergarten for dyslexia? You know, so some of the early um, signs, you know, have to do with phonological awareness, um, has difficulty rhyming words, uh, has difficulty uh, retaining letters when they're taught letters, they can't remember what letters look like, or uh, has trouble, you know, with sounds, uh, has comorbid language disorders. Um, you know, another thing too, I've noticed with young students with dyslexia, they don't like to look at print. They love you to read to them, but if you're like pointing to the words or something like that, their eyes are on the ceiling or their shoes, but they um, just really don't, you know, like to look at print, you know? Um, so I think there's already a bit of stress in terms of, you know, perception. Um, the orthographic difficulties, uh, kids with dyslexia seem to have adequate phonological skills, but simply re cannot recall spelling and writes everything phonetically. How can we help them? I know we're gonna possibly do an intervention piece, but do you have anything in the short term that you can talk about? Um, you know, again, with that, that kind of problem, um, with some of the students, something multi-sensory really helps where they trace words as they say the sounds, they turn it over, then they try to write it from memory because you're trying to improve their ability to visualize what a word, you know, looks like. So hopefully we'll do something, you know, more on intervention. But um, I think lots of times these kids are overlooked because their problem is not phonological awareness. And if we only focus on that, we're gonna miss about half the cases. So it's, um, you know, we need to have a uh, bigger umbrella for our risk factors. So you're saying that uh, there are kids with dyslexia that have the orthographic piece and they've already maybe worked through some of the phonological pieces or didn't have as severe phonological as the orthographic and, and things like that, okay. Um, how do you think dyslexia impacts the, oh wait, can dyslexia be developmentally outgrown? Um, no, dyslexia um, cannot be outgrown, um, but there's situations where it's not a problem for you anymore, depending on what you decide to do or what career you enter or what, you know, ever, but you still have dyslexia. So um, it's not outgrown, but you can put yourself in situations where it's not, you know, it's not an issue, you know? Okay. So I have a, an age old debate and discussion question that came up in the chat while we were, we were listening to your presentation. And it's always about as kids start to age into high school and a lot of times uh, people move to this, let's just accommodate and, and cut back on the instruction. We're just going to accommodate at this point. How do you think you should approach students who are, are very far behind in reading when they get to high school. Should you still be teaching them how to read when they get to high school? Should, should that be the case? Yes, absolutely. Um, we don't give up on kids. And, you know, I always thought, in, you know, make their English class or whatever, give them a solid period every day where they're learning how to read and they're focusing on literacy skills. It's going to impact their whole life if they don't become readers, better readers and writer. There's nothing more important than that. And so, you know, make it a period in high school, you know, um, or at least an elective or something and talking the students into taking it because we don't want to um, give up on you know, the kids and just, you know, you see kids have just been over accommodated and um, not remediated. Uh, and so again, we, I don't think we ever throw in the towel, you know? Right. And that doesn't mean if they have a science test and, and they need extended time that you wouldn't give that to them, but it means you don't, that's not your intervention. Still intervene, but accommodate when appropriate. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. 
uh, are there strengths? I know you talked about one of the students that you had that talked about his strengths. So are there strengths that are associated with dyslexia? Uh, what do they tend to be? Or is that just an individual by individual uh, circumstance? You know, I mean, there's often, you know, talks about, you know, gifts of dyslexia, um, but it really is on an individual by individual, you know, basis, but um, it's just discovering, you know, those strengths. But, you know, a lot of kids with dyslexia have strengths in, you know, mechanical kinds of things or um, building kinds of things or just, you know, other areas, but not necessarily so. So we can't really say there's a particular pattern of strengths, but oftentimes there are strengths, you know, in certain, you know, areas. Yeah. So uh, one uh, last area of discussion that I'd love for you to touch on, and I know you touched on it a little bit, but I've seen some comments about it, and I know it's an area of expertise of yours, but twice exceptional children who fall through the cracks, and how do we make sure that doesn't happen in schools uh, when we're, when we're um, working with students that have dyslexia that are twice exceptional? You know, and th that's a tough question. And we will talk a little bit about that when we do our assessment, you know, um, webinar. But the problem with the twice exceptional kids is lots of times their reading scores are in the average range. And so then they don't qualify, um, you know, and so, but many of them still are rather disfluent when they read. And so we want to make sure we look at their reading rate, you know, compared to peers. But, um, you know, if, if you're using some kind of discrepancy formula or, or something, it's often hard to get those, you know, kids, you know, services. Um, but, we, you know, we'll try to address that a little more when we talk about assessment, or at least for the challenges, because, you know, that is one of the challenges in dyslexia is identifying those kids accurately um, yeah. and giving them the help that they need, because, you know, with the proper help, a lot of these kids, you know, could just do such amazing things, you know, so. Yeah, I once had a student who was uh, in third grade reading novels and Harry Potter and everything else, but the writing, his writing was so far off from what it needed to be. And it was like some of the spelling samples you, you uh, showed earlier. So sometimes it'll, it'll show up there. Um, is that accurate? Yeah, you know, or absolutely. Or sometimes again, the student has dysgraphia and not dyslexia. Um, I've had a couple of cases where the student reads two or three years above grade level and their writing is two or three years below grade mm -hmm. level. You know, the, it's written language that's the problem. It's yep. not reading. And so we do have our kids that just have dysgraphia. Yep. All right. Well, the rest of the questions that we have, a lot of them have to do with uh, the assessment piece. And so what I'm going to do is encourage everyone to please take a look at the next two webinars that we have coming up uh, and please attend those webinars if you can. We do record our webinars afterwards. Uh, I would encourage anybody who asked about whether WPS has an assessment for dyslexia to go to the link that was posted uh, if you could post that one more time, Donna or Amanda, if you could post the um, link where they can sign up for updates for the uh, tests of dyslexia, that test of dyslexia, uh, we have an early version and a comprehensive version. We have a screener. Someone was asking about whether we had a screener that could be used by general education teachers. We do. Uh, if you want more information about that, please sign up uh, to be on the mailing list. Also tied to the assessment will be an interventions and recommendations guide. Um, Dr. Mather will be talking about assessment in the next uh, webinar, so please join us. Do you have any final concluding remarks, Dr. Mather? No, thank you for you know uh, putting up with me, and uh, I hope to see you in person someday. You know, again, and uh, um, it, you know it's been fun to get to talk to you all.